ING is a well-recognized brand in Poland. It's a definitely top commercial bank. Technology is the business, it can be a business. And I think CIOs generally, they've done a fantastic job when it's coming to the developing their kind of leadership capabilities, both on the understanding the business, but also taking the technology and translating the business. CIOs actually can be and are uh, equal partners to the, to the line of business. If I look back like 10 years ago, you would probably rarely see any CIO being in the management board. Now, if you go through the you know, management board of different banks, you probably will notice that most of them are actually in the, in the management board. But so that means something. That's a huge, huge transformation. This is Siana TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Slavik Stojinski, who is the Vice President of the Board and the Chief Information Officer of ING Polska. A very warm welcome, Slavik. Welcome, everyone. Glad to be here. So, Slavik, you have a master's degree in science, IT and physics from the Nikolaus Copernicus University and an MBA from the Kosminski University in Warsaw. Uh, you started your career in 2002 at City. You worked for JP Morgan in London, US, Singapore, even in North Korea. And you joined ING Polska in 2019 as the CIO and that at the age of 40. So Slavik, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Who are you really? What's your background? And how did you arrive in this position? Thank you. Thanks for reminding me about my 40. <laughs> uh, I think my you know, career, IT career or technology career was very, very typical one. I started as the, as the Linux administrator and then uh, moved to the development mm -hmm. job. And my first, but I was always like interested about like, you know, how technology can change the business and change the world, basically, obviously, when you're young, you have, a, you're looking for a big, uh, big purpose on that front. And, you know, my first job was with, uh, with City uh, when I was the information security officer at the local bank level. I was living in, in Warsaw. Yep. Um, and then I thought like, okay, maybe it's time actually to, to learn a little bit more about the business language. So the great opportunity arrived as the being uh, the technology auditor in London. So I moved there. And uh, the great value of that was actually that I was able to uh, leverage my technology knowledge at the same time to use the translation into the business values. And that was the uh, the, the first, uh, the, f the first thing that uh, I learned very deeply from that from that perspective that I'm still very leveraging at that moment. Um, and after that, you know, I was living in different uh, the different places. I was in in, in New York, I was in uh, in Singapore. I had, as you mentioned, Peter, I had a little incident in in North Korea as well. <clears throat> and then I come back to um, to Warsaw when I end up as the leading the. Um, um, shared service for and establishing and leading the shared service for the JP Morgan. At that point of time, JP Morgan was looking for to opening the global uh, shared service for the firm, and the market was great. It's still there, obviously, um, and uh, that's how I end up back to Poland. And um, you know, after some time, I decided that you know it's time to come back to technology uh, because it's my passion by design. I can even say. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, ING Poland was looking for the uh, for the CIO, so I signed up. I was successful, and ended up as the board member and the CIO here. And a very natural. <laughs> ING in Poland. What is it exactly that that ING does in Poland? Now, what is it that ING does really, really well as a business? I think uh, for, first of all, ING is a well recognized brand in Poland, not just Poland, but mm -hmm. Poland. Um, it's a definitely top commercial bank and it's uh, running a three line of business. So one is core, which is the our retail business, uh, has a business banking business, which is basically for small, medium uh, kind of companies, mm -hmm. and then has a wholesale banking, which is for the large corporations, um, international one. So that the three business lines that constitute the core of our, of our strategy. And obviously on top of that, mm -hmm. Uh, we have a number of corporate functions which are supporting that three line of business, which technology is one of them. And if you look at banking in general or ING specific, what are the, what are the most important business challenges in the organization today? 
I think uh, there's a number of them, uh, you know, mm -hmm. since probably last two years we can easily observe a number of black swans, what we, what we call it. So everything started with pretty much mm -hmm. with pandemia, which completely changed the, the way how we operate. Um, then obviously the geo ge geopolitical um, changes happened, uh, still ongoing, obviously, uh, very sad ones, but has a very significant impact on, on local market. You know, three million Ukrainians in, mm -hmm. in Poland. That's a, that's a huge uh, yeah. workforce um, and re obviously refugees uh, population. Um, that comes with inflation, increased inflation across the world. That comes with a significant number of regulatory changes in the banking sector specifically. Mm -hmm. So number of challenges, it's a, it's a big one. Business-wise, I would say, you know, further digitalization of the business, making sure that, you know, the, uh, the kind of remote banking uh, is, is fully possible on the market. And obviously making sure that the banking sector is very res resilient to the changes that are happening. That's the kind of top priority from what I'm looking for uh, at this moment. Okay. Now, I wanted to first dive a little bit into your big transformation, the, 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 the core banking transformation program that you are uh, that you're running. Can you tell us a little bit what the challenges were when you started at this, uh, at this program and can you describe that program? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I mean, we call the program NextGen Core Banking Program. Uh, although it's not just a kind of replacement of old monolithic legacy uh, core banking system, it's actually full re-architecture of the bank. So we're basically building a new bank mm -hmm. with a number of changes, uh, which obviously the car needs to go on and we're changing the different parts when it's going. It's, it's by, by design, it's a, it's a difficult challenge. Uh, I think what we're trying to address is, first of all, that you know, ING is very well known for the, for the agile uh, practices. And we have a very good mm -hmm. business model and operating model where sometimes the technology can be a, a, a bottleneck because we want to make sure that our tribes are completely independent from each other and able to work between each other as a, as a mini firm in the big bank with their own revenue, costs, uh, you know, platforms, etc. And when we do change, the change is happening in the form of kind of contract between two tribes. And that's because we have the core banking, which is monolithic, is very difficult to, to manage at technology level. So that's one. Second yeah. one is that mm -hmm. uh, you know that very well that the, the, the generally banks have a, a massive problem with uh, delivering the changes where, which are not seen by the customers. So basically the, all the platforms are available for the customer and I'm, see, and I'm kind of divided into two things. One is the planet change when you basically tell the customer we have to do the key changes, we have to shut down the system for time being so you will not have the access to the system. And obviously from the customer perspective that means he doesn't have the access to his services, which is not okay. And the second challenge is obviously yeah. the, um, the availability from the kind of, uh, you know, issues happening. Sometimes they happen and that's causing sometimes unavailability of the systems. And we basically, the transformation we're doing is, by the way, is the biggest transformation of this, this bank done ever in the history. So it's mm -hmm. a huge challenge. And, um, and that will allow us 400% of availability of all the front-end systems or call, core, let's call that core services to the, uh, to the customers, right? And thirdly, is the, okay. is the, the, the program is, uh, it's, uh, we want to make sure that the offer to the customer is fully personalized. So it's not just uh, mm -hmm. when you segment the customer and you're giving them a, a group of customers a specific offer, we actually want to make sure that the customer will be able to manage the, uh, the product, the banking product that he or she needs in the form of parameters displayed on the front end and tweak the offer to himself. So that's it, kind of three okay. key objectives for that, for that program. Massive, massive change. So the, the challenge was to get rid of the legacy eh? Absolutely. And, uh, and, and to put in place a much more agile system and also to be able to better serve the, the customers. Yes. 
but doing that and, uh, and, and then doing that in a modular way uh, and, and in such a way that you don't disrupt the current relationship with the client. So that's, and that's, so that's a huge, huge program. So how did you address that? How did you start that? And what's the strategy of this program? Well, first of all, we need to choose the platform. <laughs> So that mm -hmm. step is uh, behind us. We choose one of the core mm -hmm. banking uh, systems, completely innovative. It's based on the smart contract concept. If you're interested, obviously, there is a, a famous uh, Peter Drucker article that he actually published in, uh, I don't remember exact date, but if you actually scan on the Harvard Business Review, you can easily find it. And I think that's a great mm -hmm. and eye-opening uh, for the way how to build the shared economy concept in practice through the smart contracts and kind of making sure that the bank is an integrator of different uh, solutions and platforms rather than building everything from the, from the scratch. So that was the first step. Mm -hmm. Then obviously we need to uh, choose the uh, you know, first product to migrate, right? So that's behind us as well. We have the first product on actually on production given to, the, to our customers. Uh, which is super exciting because we, uh, obviously we see that uh, everything is working in, in practice. The system itself is cloud-based. Mm -hmm. We At this moment, we're running the mm -hmm. platform internally in our data center. But the plan is basically that we will take that platform and push it to the public cloud. And obviously, it's easy to push the systems to the public cloud, uh, but pushing them in a proper way, which I will explain in a minute, it's a it's a super hard yep. task, and as you know, there is not many examples on the on the banking sector globally that that was uh, that was possible. Uh, so that's the stage, and obviously, you know, the rearchitecting everything require a good sequencing of different things. And important to note it is that you know typically these programs are starting as the as the technology programs, um, but mm -hmm. very quickly the business realized that. You know, because we're deploying a, a product on a new platform, there is a great opportunity to also optimize or change or innovate, depends what, what, what's the objective here, on the business side. So that, yeah. that, that program becoming a very quickly transformational program uh, that's require pretty much involving every single unit in the bank. Um, and that's a difficulty. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit the timeline of, of the complete program? So you say, uh, first you need to develop the strategy, then you need to yes. uh, select a platform, then you need to implement the first uh, product, and then the, the, the consequent other modules or other products and services uh, in place. What's the timeline uh, of, of, of the complete program? And, and, and tell us how did you choose the platform and, and also what, what are really smart contracts? So these three questions at the same time here. Absolutely. Uh, well, we start. We started the uh, end of 2021, um, mm -hmm. which is not far away from uh, from today. The plan is basically to move mm -hmm. everything, so complete the kind of transformation piece uh, by end of 2025. Mm -hmm. So still a lot of work ahead of us. Um, yeah. the, the way how we choose the uh, our core banking system is. It's basically, first of all, you start with reviewing what is available on the market. And there is a number of mm -hmm. traditional core banking systems. And there is a number of, there is some systems which are obviously taking, trying to tackle the, the core banking challenge completely in a different way. And we mm -hmm. actually decided to go this different route, different meaning that uh, it's a more risky route, obviously, um, mm -hmm. because we're actually going into some direction which we don't know everything from day one, uh, mm -hmm. and that's and that's the and that's the challenge um, to manage. But uh, at the same point of time, uh, it's giving a more benefit to the customers, and that's and we all here to serve the customer and being a good for customer, and that's something that we want to make sure that is happening uh, on a daily basis. So putting the customer in the in the front of everything what we do smart contract uh, mm -hmm. your third question um, smart contract is a kind of concept that is allow allowing the full personalizing of the offer and actually the product is developed by the business itself so basically in order to develop a smart contract you only need uh, some basic python skills to to deliver that uh, that product so obviously it's done together with technology um, 
but we want to make sure that the product managers and the squads and uh, the tribes we're working together with, uh, they, are, they have the ability to fully innovate on that product and deliver that many releases of that smart contract in a day if they need. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that's basically the concept. And it's a, like a little container inside the big platform. So you can basically you know, build as many smart contracts as you want um, on the platform. So you have selected, you have made a brave decision uh, and you have selected a, a pretty advanced uh, and intelligent new core banking system, a platform. Uh, and now you're building on, on top of that. So that's completely different than in the past where a bank would start from scratch and develop everything themselves, right? Yes. So, uh, so what, what's the advantage, the disadvantage of going with the platform? Well, it's a greenfield project. <laughs> to some extent, mm -hmm. because, uh, because we're convinced that this is the right strategy from, from, from going into that direction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, advantages we all already, I think we cover it when about these three objectives for the, for the customers. Disadvantage is that there is a certain areas that we don't know yet. So we're actually discovering that mm -hmm. together with the provider uh, who are helping yeah. us to build, you know, both the product and the platform itself. Um, and why the platform is mature and is used by a few banks already globally, then obviously ING is complex. ING is large bank. And ING has a large offer of the product to the customers and those products need to be reflected mm -hmm. on that platform. So sometimes that's, that's you know, it's a, it's a very um, close cooperation with the provider to make sure that uh, it's it's possible and uh, it will have to be possible and uh, you know the the transformation that we're doing is done also timely so there's a you know resources time budget wise commitment to do that yeah so. and is this the in the ing family in, in the different countries is poland playing uh, um, uh, a leadership role here are, are you the first country to go with a platform if you compare it to other countries and because typically in bank every country will have still have their own uh, platforms right or still have their own system uh, absolutely i mean uh, the bank did not took that decision obviously globally the bank did not took that decision to use mm -hmm. that platform globally that's that's you know mm -hmm. assessment uh, needs to happen um Obviously, we do this project together with our colleagues in, in the group. We're not completely mm -hmm. separated from, from the group. We want to be part and we are a part of the, of the ING. So that's not going to change. Uh, are we leader here? Well, we do the project. So we definitely, uh, you know, innovating on that space very deeply. Mm -hmm. um, my objective is obviously to make sure that the, the, this program is a, is a success, big success. If it's going to be leveraged for other countries, I, I don't know. That's the, uh, that, that's probably not the stage to actually talk about. And tell us about the first products that you have delivered with this platform. What is the what is the first applications? What is the first segment that you're serving mm -hmm. with this? And what are the results so far? This is the uh, this is the uh, this is the loan for the this is in Polish lotte. It's a loan for the customers. Mm -hmm. um, so the customers can basically go on the front end. And then, so it's like a full integration between the front end, middleware, and the and the back end, uh, where basically customer can go on the platform and you know parameterize their own loan and just apply in the bank. That's the that's the first one. <laughs> okay. And what are the what are the next ones that are coming up? And how many how many modules do you need to develop like this? Uh, it it will be the the next so next one will be a, a mortgage because obviously. It's a basic product for the mm -hmm. uh, in the bank, and the next one will be savings. Yep. Um, so we're obviously doing that. The, the program is aligned through the uh, through the products, right? So we don't do the big bank. We definitely don't want to stop anything. The you know the bank needs to run as it's running now. Uh, it needs to continue developing on the old old. Let's call that for a minute old platform. Uh, but at the same time, we will retrofit whatever was developing that part into the uh, into the new platform, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think it will be cool. It will be completely kind of something new that uh, not many banks actually done so far. So, so I'm really looking forward yeah. for to to see more results on on that front. 
And the way that you organize, you've explained to me, is in, is in a biz dev ops way, yes. uh, if, if that's correct. And, and so, and one tribe uh, takes ownership of, of one such uh, product. Is that how that is organized? Yes and no. I mean, we have uh, some tribes which are, for the, for the big, large uh, products, there is, you know, one tribe that is responsible end to end for, for that particular product. But we also have the tribes mm -hmm. which are taking a collective, I would say, a responsibility for such smaller, still very important, but smaller products uh, together. And uh, ING is obviously, yes, it's a, it's a full biz dev ops uh, culture uh, and obviously mm -hmm. operating model as well and technology. So it's not something that we, you know, we do agile only on in technology. That's that's not the way how ING operates. It's definitely that we are together in the journey of delivering the product, and it's very important for for the bank as well because, uh, you know, developers don't want to just develop a code, right? They want to be, they want to see the purpose, right? And if they see the purpose, and purpose obviously is the customer uh, happy face, let's call that for a minute then obviously that's the best reward for, for us as the, as the technologists. Another important aspect that you uh, mentioned already is the, the migration uh, to a, uh, a public cloud. So yes. tell us about that aspect of, 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 uh, of your program. So where are you? What's your strategy? What's your vision to go uh, for public uh, cloud migration? Mm -hmm. Public cloud, uh, it's a very interesting actually topic in, in Poland because um, Regulatory-wise, I believe we were uh, late compared to our other markets, in particularly in Asia or uh, or US. And uh, mm -hmm. two, roughly two years ago, there was a new regulation upcoming, which actually allow a, a few things to be done from on that front. So since then, we actually starting the, uh, the the program on first of all introducing the cloud first uh, kind of principle in the bank, meaning that every single new technology investment into the platform or systems is assessed from the possibility of running that on the on the public cloud. Is it either the infrastructure from that we're running end-to-end -end infrastructure or it's leveraging the SaaS solution? It depends obviously on the use case, right? Uh, the cloud mm -hmm. program, the objective here is basically that is to move as much as possible. We, we basically, the bank is running their own two data, we, we have own two data centers, right? And we're basically taking the, every, every single system, assessing what we can do with that system, and then either to move to the public cloud or move somewhere else. And um, I would say it's easy to move the um, application or your workload to the public cloud without business benefits, I would say. It's, it's very hard mm -hmm. to move in the proper way. And proper way for me means that, first of all, we're moving that workload in a cloud native uh, perspective, meaning that we're using the open standards. We have to refactor the application in the way that it never depends on one cloud, publi one cl public cloud provider. And we are able mm -hmm. to easy move those workloads between one to another. And that's very important because if you look on the geopolitical um, situation that is happening, it's very important actually that the bank is able to operate from any place in the world. Uh, obviously with yep. proper compliance, risk and security protections taken in place, but, but it's very important from the resiliency perspective. And that's one of the kind of objectives from, from the business perspective. The other one obviously is the you know, giving the access to full analytics, for example, right? Making sure that the business can scale up and scale down depends on the on the demand required. You know, some, for me, objective is also make sure that from te 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 purely technology, IT for IT, let's call that for a minute, or from infrastructure perspective, is to make sure that giving the infrastructure deployment responsibility to the tribes. So they responsible end to end from creating whatever is needed to run the application or workloads on the public cloud, rather than having a relationship um, or dependency, let's call it for a minute, with the infrastructure tribe that uh, is responsible for deploying that infrastructure at this moment. There's many objectives, yeah. but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a definitely a, a, a one of the core pillars of our, 
of our strategy. But it's interesting that you mentioned uh, being resilient is, and, and that that's a big reason to go to the client so that you're not dependent of your local data center. Yes. Uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in the preparation of this interview, you told me about a Ukraine bank that came to, uh, to, to you in Poland to, see, uh, to seek some help. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's, a, it's a obviously everyone uh, looking for the situation, what's going on in, in Ukraine. And basically, on the beginning of that conflict, there was, a, well, the Ukrainian banks, they're also running the, the local data centers, right? And resiliency mm -hmm. pattern was that there is a two data center which are, you know, uh, backupping the workloads between each other. But uh, from the geographic perspective, you know, never, no one basically looking on the conflict perspective, right? And having a tanks in front of your data center, it's a very tough situation to manage. So, yeah. so, you know, we had a situation where, where that bank came to, um, through the local uh, regulatory uh, regime and asking for help, basically. And obviously that, at that point of time, we realized that you know, we might have a similar, hopefully never happen, but we might have a similar yep. situation. So. so Slavic, in your um, uh, cloud strategy, there's a lot of regulations about, around data and where data needs to reside, the data sovereignty and, and, and so on. How, how do you look at that? How, how do you manage that? I would say there is many regulations touching uh, banking sector, many, many. Um, and obviously data is the new oil, as, as you know, famously someone said. But um, I would say the, from the cloud perspective, looking from the cloud, for example, perspective, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a couple of things. So number one is the GDPR, right? So we need to make sure that we're meeting mm -hmm. all the requirements. Second one is this, I, I would talk about the core, I would say, uh, regulations rather than just all of them. Yep. Uh, the other one is that the local cloud regulation, which basically says that in principle, we should use the local geographical cloud providers, data centers located in, uh, in Poland. Uh, that's the second yep. one. Third one is that if you think about like who's providing those cloud services, this is all the big American companies where obviously in the yep. US, we have a cloud act where basically in the particular situation, the cloud provider should give the access to the data or to workloads maybe, to the workloads of the customers. Mm -hmm. And obviously from the local perspective, regulatory perspective, that should not be the case. So obviously applying the proper security and you know, encryption and making sure that the provider never has the access to the key, never has the access to the data, customer data, that's, that's, that's very important. And uh, you know, that's, that's obviously the priority in that, in that program to make sure that is happening so and obviously you know that so that's the that's the generic regulations but if you look on the sector regulations so like you know retail have a different regulations might have a different regulations wholesale banking might have a different regulations trading might have a different regulations right so we need to all cover all of them to make sure that everything is met uh, and we are not you know exposed to the regulatory scrutiny so that's 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 obviously primary yeah. objective and do you have a, a, a target date uh, on, your, on your radar where you say in, in that year I want to decommission all my uh, data centers? <laughs> it's an interesting question because obviously <laughs> I mentioned that we're trying to uh, move uh, our applications in a proper way. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a tough task. It's a very tough task. Uh, I don't have a particular date yet. I would say don't know yet. We already started the moving some mm -hmm. of the applications, there, so there is a definitely success. And obviously, part of that building the first application, there is a full framework coming on how to build that applications. So the factory, I would say, of running these workloads and moving them to the cloud is there. So I think the migration will happen very quicker than at this moment. Although I'm very happy with the program at this moment, but we have to remember also about one thing. You know, the bank has the two types, just putting the very generic statement, the bank has a two types of application. One is, is something that we're developing on our own. So basically we control a full destiny of that, of that application. We can change the stack, we can change the way how we develop, we can change anything. 
And the second piece of the type of application is that we're taking the application from some external provider. Right? And that's difficult sometimes because there is some providers which are very mature and cloud ready, I would say, in a proper way. Some of them are not ready and probably will never be ready. So we have two choices, either to keep that application in our data center or move maybe to some other data center uh, or just replace the application. And obviously, if you think from that perspective on how many applications the bank has, that's where the complexity is coming from. So. Very difficult okay. task. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about your uh, IT organization. Mm -hmm. So ING is the, the number one bank, the biggest bank in, uh, in Poland, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So that also means that your IT organization is one of the biggest in, uh, in, in Poland, I can imagine. So, uh, so I understand it's more than 1,200 people. So how do, you, how do you organize that? What's, what's your IT operating model? Well, the operating model has a um, couple of principles. Number one, I want to make sure that all our tech talents are aligned to the line of business. So majority is there. Um, the other part is what I call IT for IT. So it can be infrastructure services, it can be some process uh, oriented functions, which are going actually across all the technology. Um, it can be, uh, you know, all the corporate functions like HR or, or compliance or risk. That's something that is it's very centralized because running that in an agile uh, mode, I would say, operating model, it will be extremely hard given that probably, you know, some of the, for example, the reporting or financial reporting or regulatory reporting is exactly the same for all our line of business. So it actually makes sense to centralize. Them. On top of that, we also have something what we call the center of excellence, which basically the serving mm -hmm. the technology services to the entire technology. Just give you the example enterprise architecture function will be run centrally. So basically producing technology standards, obviously together with the other technologies in the bank, but being responsible for that standard and uh, deploying them across all the technology function, that would be the role to make sure that is there, right? So the effective implementation of the standard. We have the functions which are, um, we might be focusing, for example, on learning and development. So we don't have a, a particular function that everyone running in their own tribe. We have a centralized function, which is taking the holistic view of what the skills and competences for the future we need in order to deliver across the technology, across the bank, because actually in many cases it's delivering across the bank, not internet technology only. So um, yeah, so that, that's pretty much how we, how we organized ourselves. Okay. And so, small sidetrack. Yes. Um, yeah. the, the, the CISO and the enterprise architects, are they, do they report into IT or do they report separately? They do report to myself, um, both CISO okay. and, uh, and the chief architect. So it's uh, obviously different functions because uh, CISO is running a kind of mix of operational services from security perspective, but also mm -hmm. the security standards definition, I would say. And uh, enterprise architecture has actually uh, three functions. One is the um, making sure that the strategy, technology strategy execution is effective, either through the KPIs or through the mm -hmm. objective settings or managing what we call QBR, so quarterly business review, meaning that agreeing the kind of key task that needs to be delivered on, on a quarterly basis. Second thing is the enterprise architects, which are looking on the uh, on the standards, setting the standards and executing of that standards. And the third function is a center of excellence or expertise to uh, to run the solution architects, which are basically delivering the technology solution to the particular business need. And that's the way how it's set it up. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about your role. Uh, so uh, you've been in, in this CIO role now for a couple of years. Uh, so you have things under control. You have this big, uh, this big transformation, next-gen core platform that you're putting in place or a, a big, uh, many uh, multiple year uh, program. So today, where do you spend most of your time? What is today fundamentally your most important role in the organization? Well, I have a two hats. So first of all, I'm the primary, I would say, I'm the, I'm the board member. 
Um, so I have a responsibility mm -hmm. to co-manage or co-lead the bank with, together with the rest of my colleagues in, uh, in the management board. Um, so mm -hmm. obviously I spent a lot of time on, you know, representing the company, attending different events, setting the strategy, working together with pretty much everyone to make sure that the bank is developing as we, as we would like to. And then my second job is obviously mm -hmm. being a CIO, so purely focus on technology and both from maintenance perspective, so maintaining as, as well as we can from what we have, but also delivering a new capability for, for the businesses. That's, that's two different, I would say, um, mm -hmm. things to, to manage. Okay, and if you look back, I mean, you've been into, in this business now for 20 years, the role of the CIO has changed dramatically. So yes. how do you look back five, 10 years ago and today, and maybe how do you see the role of the CIO evolve in the future? It's my favorite question. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I strongly believe that, you know, technology is the business. It can be a business. Um, mm -hmm. And I think CIOs generally, statistically, okay, they've done a fantastic job when it's coming to the developing the kind of leadership capabilities, both on the understanding the business, but also taking the technology and translating it to the business and talking through the values, talking through the building the proper culture, developing the people, etc. And uh, so mm -hmm. if I look back like 10 years ago, you know, you would probably rarely see any CIO being in the management board. Now, if you go through the, you know, management board of different banks, you probably will notice that most of them are actually in the, in the management board. That, so that means something. That's a huge, huge transformation uh, on, on that front. And I think the CIOs actually can be and are uh, equal partners to the, to the line of business. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the two key things that happened. Um, Future-wise, um, I think, you know, I think further kind of um, transformation or evolution, I would say, of making sure that CIO is less technology focused, more augmented to the business, I think that will be the, uh, the key. That's require completely different skills than right now. Uh, so yeah. it, I'm, I'm observing actually very closely um, to see what's going on on that front. Yeah. So Slavik, for the last 10 years or so, um, people have been predicting that the CIOs will be the CEOs of the future because they know so many aspects of the business, they have their hands on everything, they, they see all the different processes and so on. Uh, but still hasn't materialized that much. I only know a couple of uh, examples. Do you see that happening more in the future? And, and maybe to bring it back to you, is, is what's next in your career? Do you see yourself evolving outside of IT in the future? That's a, that's a complex question, actually. <laughs> so many elements. <laughs> um, I would say I heard many times, actually, that CIOs, it might be a great candidate for the... CEO in the future, but as you said, mm -hmm. I haven't seen any particular, or maybe I just don't know, particular example. Um, and I think uh, it's really related actually to less to the company itself, it's more to the regulators. If they are ready mm -hmm. to accept someone who's the ex-CIO and becoming a CEO of the, of the big bank, um, I think mm -hmm. that's something that CIOs should be working more together with the regulator to demonstrate that they're ready for, for that kind of assignment. Um, I don't believe there is a huge belief actually in regulatory, um, in regula with regulators that, that this, is the, um, this is a proper assignment at this moment. Uh, that's my perception okay. only, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Second thing is that my, my next assignment, it's a, it's a tough question because uh, I definitely, I took a decision to come back to technology. I was not doing technology for three years mm -hmm. when I was with my previous company and I, and I decided to come back. So obviously there is something, there's a passion for me with technology and I want to do technology. Um, mm -hmm. I don't believe that there is any other better bank for me to be 
um, at least at this moment. Um, I really enjoy ING. It's a, it's a great potential. Um, but obviously, trying to respond on your question, what's my next assignment? I think I see m myself as probably moving to, you know, maybe some private equity company, which is, um, you know, taking the different market assessment and choosing the companies to invest. Uh, that's something mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I've done in the past, um, not through the private equity, but through the investments, different arms to investing in yeah. different companies. So that that's something I'm really enjoying. And I think it's a pretty natural because if you look on the uh, ecosystem of startups and, you know, small companies and something like that, they're all technology companies. So there's a huge potential for people like myself to be in that part. And if they want to be enjoying the, you know, still being with technology, but doing something slightly different. So, okay. and you know, let's talk a little bit more about you. Yep, sure. And, and I think, ahead. you know, the, I think Richard Feynman, one of my gurus, I would say, said the other day that, you know, the, I will not quote exactly him, but, um, but he basically in principle said that, you know, if you go deeply enough with some topic you, um, you're exploring, most of the topics are becoming very interesting. So it's less about the topic, it's just about how deep you want to go. <laughs> So Slavik, how can you be successful in managing more than 1,200 people? What's your secret for success there? How do you make sure that you organize talent, that you attract the right talent, that you make them successful, that you retain the right talent? What's your success as a, as a manager? Well, I definitely you know, don't meet uh, all my team. Um, it's, it will be very hard. Um, I'm trying to know everyone, mm -hmm. which is already a difficult uh, task. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm rather, my job is going through the values and making sure that the teams know what the behaviors are welcome. Then make sure that mm -hmm. those teams have an opportunity to demonstrate those behaviors. And the third thing is to make sure that the teams um, feel that those behaviors make sense and that's 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 my job so that's when it's coming to the teams when it's coming to leaders or managers my job is to making sure that mm -hmm. managers become leaders and have an opportunity to try and fail and learn so i'm trying to build that culture just to make sure that there is enough trust and there is enough room so they can try different things but you know, my job at, at this point of time is actually create the new leaders, uh, so I can be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not be uh, needed, because uh, some other people can step up and basically either do my job or do different jobs um, on, on that front, right? So, so that's, that's the key. Um, that's the key to success. Yep, I would say. And let's, let's talk about leadership a little bit more. So, uh, because, I mean, management is one aspect, but leadership is probably more important eh, to, uh, to uh, have success and, and to um, well, create value in an organization. So how would you describe your own leadership style? And how do you think people around you perceive your leadership style? What do you, what do you think they say about you when, when you're not around? <laughs> Well, uh, the, the, last, the last one is very interesting because um, I'm actually running an anonymous chat with all my uh, teams monthly basis. So they can come up with any questions mm -hmm. they like, any feedback they like. And I strongly believe actually that the feedback is a gift. So it's not something mm -hmm. that uh, you should afraid, you should tackle and take on the board and, you know, either do something with that or, I mean, change or adjust or continue sometimes to continue because feedback doesn't have to mean that it, it's negative. Um, I, I think I'm giving a lot of space um, to my teams uh, to, to try different things. Uh, I'm trying to give the career opportunities uh, because that's, that's very important for pretty much for everyone. Obviously with the assumption that, you know, career, your own career is your own task. So you have to step up and be ready for the things and ask questions and go around and try things, different things. You know, all my life I tried 
I think I, I've proven that I'm taking a, a reasonable calculated risk to try different things. And I'm trying to actually, you know, include that in the organization to make sure that, you know, mm -hmm. people aren't afraid of trying new things. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm running a big transformation. So if you ask me what my people would tell me about when I'm not there, I think, you know, uh, the teams who are individuals who are looking for stability, probably they have a quite uh, interesting comments about myself. <laughs> but my job is to make sure that the banks has the best technology on the market. So, and it's a tough task. It's a very tough task given the speed of change, given the way, you know, talent shortage on the, on, on the market, great resignation that is happening, touching Europe as well. Yeah, so all these things, it's a, it's, a, it's a great combination of things to make sure that it's somehow linked together uh, and it's still working. Well, we, we talked about leadership. Let's talk about your personality mm -hmm. because I believe that success is driven by your personality, by your values, by your convictions and so on. And you shared with us that your MBTI profile, your Myers-Briggs personality type indicator uh, is an ESTP. So that's an on, also known as the entrepreneur and that's somebody with extroverted, observant, thinking and prospecting personality traits and they tend to be energetic, they are action oriented, they're deftly navigating whatever is in front of them and they love uncovering life's opportunities uh, and whether socializing with others or in more personal pursuits. And, and you said earlier that risk taking some risk is uh, also fits in this personality type. So I'm going to present you with a couple of strengths of uh, that personality profile and you tell me which ones that you recognize and, and how you deal with that. So typically entrepreneurs type ESTPs, the strengths are that they are bold, that they are uh, rational and practical, that they are original thinkers, that can be very perceptive, that they're very direct and sociable. So how does that fit the bill for you? Well, first of all, let me start that my wife is a psychologist. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> believe me or not that Peter, uh, when you send me the, um, the ask to complete that assessment, MBTI, I believe, uh -huh. um, yeah. you know, that was... She was not happy. Well, it was not the first one, let me put that way. <laughs> so since we, we were actually <laughs> dating, I was completing some different surveys, assessments, etc. It's never changed. I'm still there. My wife is happy with me, so... <laughs> <laughs> I guess there, that means something. Um, no, I think the description fits, uh, fits very well. Um, mm -hmm. It has the consequences, obviously. Uh, you probably will cover the disadvantage as well in a minute. But I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here to build the capability. And that's the, that's the core mm -hmm. objective for me. Running what we have is obviously very important and kind of I consider as a given. It needs to run, it's there, mm -hmm. but where are we taking the organization into the next step? That's, that's the key. And that's what I'm trying to show pretty much to everyone. Like, don't be afraid of trying new things. Just do it. If you fail, that's fine. Just make sure that you learn, right? That you don't repeat that mistakes. Um, and that, yeah. that's very, I think, powerful tool because that means that, well, you need to have enough courage. So meaning, deliver on your promise. When you say, do you do something, just, just do it, make sure that it's happening. If it's not happening, you know, just make sure that the proper communication is there, do the replanning and different things. Uh, I definitely trust my teams. Trust is so basic nowadays that, it, you know, you cannot run a successful large organization without trusting people. So people always comes first. And uh, I also strongly believe that we can do anything we want with that organization. As long as obviously we're not, you know, breaking any regulations, you know, we're not deviating from the risk frameworks and, you know, many things that the banks are impacted from that perspective. But, you know, that's, we, we are modern organization, right? We, we want, from one point of view, we obviously have this concept of tribe squads and, you know, many other things. Um, regulatory wise, that's require us to run a 
kind of old classical way as a pyramid of hierarchy, let me put on leadership or management. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very much trying to combine both of things, but the principles stick, right? Trust, courage, yeah. um, acting as the owner of the company, or whatever the role you're doing, you co-owning yeah. a piece of uh, firm. So that's, that's kind of the values I really um, looking for. And also if I see you really admire. Now, reflecting on what you just said, I think I, I would agree. I mean, you're in, 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 a, in a very interesting spot. Uh, with, with bank used to be very, I mean, they, 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 were, they were not necessarily the, um, the environments, uh, environments with most innovation in the past. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, uh, days, I think that has changed. There's a lot of innovation going on in banks and they're creating platforms and collaboration with other companies and, and their apps are, are very important and it's, it's an app that people use a lot. So there's a big opportunity nowadays, I think, for, for banks to reinvent themselves and to, uh, to offer new services and new things to, to customers, right? No, absolutely. You know, the, I think what we as the technologies particularly, um, mm -hmm. not done well, not just to say like we're doing everything well. I think we should definitely work more on the kind of employee branding activities, right? Because banks are really interesting. Mm -hmm. Banks are really complex. Uh, banks has a pretty much any technology you can think of, right? And if you think from the young person trying to, well, looking for, you know, first assignment, second assignment or building your career, you know, banks are great places. But many people don't know. I would, I would agree. Many people don't know yeah. actually what's going on in the banks from technology perspective. They all, they all want to go to Facebook and, and Google or something and, and go and work there. Yes. So let's go back to your personality. And, and nobody's perfect, uh, Slavek, not even you and me. And so uh, not even ESTP uh, uh, people. So weaknesses of the entrepreneur of the ESTP profile is that they can be very insensitive. They can be impatient. They can take too many risks, so being risk prone. Sometimes they're unstructured, they miss the bigger picture or they can be defiant. So which of these weaknesses do you recognize as something that maybe you had in the past and that you had to overcome? And can you give an example on how you worked on that uh, part of your personality? Mm -hmm. I remember my wife actually gave me some um great article some time ago. I don't remember author and, uh, you know, exact research what, what, what was done. But basically, I remember one sentence where basically saying that whenever you're getting a more senior in your job, your mm -hmm. empathy decreasing. And that's, that's something that, you know, touched me so much um, that I still have a little note on my, you know, um, LCD monitor saying like, remember about this, mm -hmm. because it's very easy actually to go into the, you know, switch your brain into the operational task and, and doing many, many tasks, you know, cut the communication. Uh, and obviously when you're cutting communication, you coming as someone who's very direct, uh, very brutal sometimes. Uh, but that's not the case. It's just, there's so many tasks. Uh, there's so many things to do that you have to step back and just say like, hey, I have actually my, my team, direct team who can manage that. So that's giving them a, a power to do the things. That's, that's important. At the same point of time, making sure that you explain why we're doing something. It's a one of the core principles of, you know, the question you ask about how you manage your, what's your leadership style and how you manage teams. Right. That's, that's very important to explain. And um, I'm definitely not unstructured. I still have my, I, I'm using a great to-do uh, application just because it has some, I mean, so many different activities that I need some up just to make sure that that is there. And obviously pen for doing the notes is better than just going on the meeting and not doing notes because you're completely forgetting a month later what's happened there. So, so unstructured is definitely not, uh, not something I'm, I'm, I'm there, but you know, you absolutely, I mean, that description is very accurate, right? It, it's more about what you do with, with, with that weaknesses or disadvantages and how you manage them. 
and obviously modern mm -hmm. psychologist uh, theories and I guess research as well is showing that you rather should focus on your strengths than weaknesses to compensate that. Um, and as you said, yeah. no one is perfect. I'm not perfect as well. So. Let's uh, uh, dive a little bit deeper. And we talked about um, your management style, your leadership style, your characteristics, your personality. Um, let's talk about your values. Uh, you shared with us that you have two boys, six and nine. So uh, still in primary school and, and some of the best ages that your, uh, your kids can be. What are the values that you're passing on to, uh, to your children? We have a lot of conversation actually about this with my, with my family. Not with kids directly, but kind of trying to understand what what what's mm -hmm. what's meaning of life and what's the what's what's uh, what we appreciate as adults and trying to give to our two boys. Um, mm -hmm. My two boys, actually, yes, you said the the, the nine and uh, and uh, seven. They actually born this. Uh, they actually born the same day, just two years delta, which is quite a funny fact. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to show them that follow your passion. That's number one. Um, so whatever you're interested and in, whatever you want to do in your life, try it. Do it. Don't be afraid. The world is out there. So that's one of the things. Have fun. Right? Having fun is important in life. Uh, it's too mm -hmm. many events that are not fun. <laughs> so having fun is important in life. Uh, obviously, love someone. Um, because that will, uh, that, that, that's very important. Um, and have a courage to basically to do whatever you want in your life and, and try it. That, yeah, that's, that's the key, I would say. Now, I can imagine that many good things have happened to you in your life and you've built a lot of uh, success, uh, Slavek. Mm -hmm. But we all have our downturns as well. So can you maybe share with us one of the, the worst things that has ever happened in your life and, and how you overcome that and what you learned from it? Well, I cannot say that I had uh, some very negative situation in my life. I actually was quite fortunate if I compare myself to uh, the other people that, you know, suffer from different things. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of my biggest kind of... Um, from the kind of values perspective element was that when you actually mm -hmm. finishing this the study right and and then you're thinking okay what next or that's it right and then um, and that was the moment where i realized like what i actually want to do right so it took me actually some time mm -hmm. to see that how to switch from the mode of like exploring the world and the science and uh, you know different concepts every day and then I finished the study and then, okay, what next? The job is that, that's it? That, that, that's the end of the story for the rest of your life? Right, so that was an interesting moment um, because it took me some time mm -hmm. actually to find a job. Um, maybe not a particular job, but actually particular activity that, uh, that would translate into the job. Uh, that would be yep. something that follow, following my passions. So I never do the job that uh, actually I'm not passionate about. That's my principle number one, right? Um, so if it's becoming boring, not interesting, maybe I'm not going deep enough, as I said before, <laughs> uh, then it's time for change, yes. In your life, what is it that you fear most and what is it that you love most? I fear most about my family. I don't fear about mm -hmm. myself. Um, as you said, I'm 40, probably still a few years to go ahead. <laughs> But um, no, but I'm more. I, my my most views are about uh, family. That's that's the key. Mm -hmm. uh, what I love the most, well, my kids. Like seeing how they developing and how smart they are. And you know, when I was nine and and and, and uh, seven, I don't remember doing the things that they do. So it's interesting, interesting to spending time with them and actually learning from them. Like the way how they coming yeah. up with linking different ideas is amazing. So I love spend time mm -hmm. with them. And obviously that translates into the business wise as well. Right. Because taking the different ideas and seeing them, how they can be deployed in the large bank and prototyping them and seeing like some of them are successful, some of them not, obviously. 
but seeing how the things are growing, yeah. that's the that's that's really what I like. Like, yes, wow, that's that that's something I want to do every day. <laughs> Slavic, tell me, do you have a personal mantra uh, that you live by that helps you at uh, difficult uh, moments in your life? Yes, I have. My hobby, my key hobby, I would say, uh, is uh, sailing. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mantra is coming from sailing. <laughs> it basically says that mm -hmm. you know the ships are safe where are in the harbor but actually not that's not the purpose why the ships are built for mm -hmm. right? very smart <laughs> so you need to get out with your ship and conquer the world and discover the world Absolutely. right we have one life <laughs> that's it <laughs> only one so slavic let's end this with my favorite question and that is what's the advice that you would either give to your younger self or to people watching these, uh, these interviews and, uh, and that have also the ambition to become a top CIO when they're only 40 years old of a, of a big bank. So what's the advice to uh, uh, ambitious digital uh, leaders of the future? I would say never give up on your core values, never, because mm -hmm. you will have to look in the mirror <laughs> every day and you want to recognize yourself. So that's, that's very important. Second thing I would say, um, try new things. Don't be afraid. The world is there. You want to be successful, try different things. Just don't be afraid. Okay. And on these two advices, Slavik, thank you so much for sharing all your insights, you your, uh, your experience, your vision. It was a pleasure and I look forward to meeting you soon. Whenever we get together in Warsaw or here in Belgium, thank you so much. Thank you very much.